This is an introduction to color mixing using the Liquitex color map and mixing guide. Color mixing can be fun, easy, creative, or it can, in some cases, be hard, tedious, frustrating work. Let me show you the easy way. Hello, my name is Russell Woody. I'm an artist and a technical consultant to Benny and Smith, the producers of Liquitex art materials. In the next 30 to 40 minutes, I'm going to show you how you can mix any color that you can think of, any color that you can see, easily, quickly, without any problems. Now that may seem kind of hard to do if you've come into contact with some of the color systems and color problems that you've had to deal with in the past, including some of the systems that you see here. These systems don't work for several reasons, and there's some systems here that have been produced for Liquitex products in the past that don't work quite too well either. And the reason for that is that these color systems are printed inks, and printed inks do not show you what comes out of the tube. You can mix forever and not match any of these colors up here. Another problem with these charts is that they are theory, and they are exactly that. Theory does not work when it comes many times to practical pragmatic color mixes. For instance, I'm sure that you've heard sometime along the way that there are three primaries in paint of red, yellow, and blue. And from these three primaries, you can mix all other colors. That's the second statement. And I know if you've tried to do that, you've been somewhat surprised that you couldn't mix all of the other colors from those three primaries. So if it works, it's truth. If it doesn't work, it's a lie. And we go on from there. Another thing you've probably heard is that complementary colors, colors opposite on the color wheel, make neutral gray when they are mixed together. You mix these two colors across the wheel, they should mix a neutral gray, or some books say black. Now when you do that, for instance, you have a red here and a green here, and you mix those two together, what do you get? Normally, mud, right? So to make that work, you have to worry about the semantics of what is red. There are thousands of reds out there. And what you've done is probably picked a red that is a little bit cooler than the one that is across from the green on the wheel. So what you need to do to make neutrals work is split the red. Split the complement. Use a warm red, a cool red. Mix those two reds together so they will center in on the green and move them back and forth until you have a direct complementary mix, and that will neutralize better the color across the wheel. Another semantic problem that you may run into is the fact that we deal with color as artists uh, from the old master's point of view. From the point of view of chemistry, we talk about such lovely sounding words as ultramarine blues, cadmium red deeps, uh, alizarin crimsons, rose matters. And do we know what that means when it comes to color? Well, most people don't because they haven't had a chance to go out and buy all those colors. But this is a cadmium red deep. Now, I'm not lying to you, that's really cadmium red deep. It may look different than your cadmium red deep because everything you see here is labeled cadmium red deep by one company or another. Everything here is cadmium red deep. They're not lying to you, it's true cadmium red deep. There are that many cadmium red deeps out there. And if you learn how to paint with this cadmium red deep, you won't know how to paint with this cadmium red deep because it works differently. So again, we need to describe color better. A good illustration of that is there's a tribe of Eskimos in Alaska. They don't have a word for the color green. They lump green and blue together as one verbal term. 
Now, because of that, they can't use green as effectively as you can because they don't have all those words in their minds to des describe the differences between greens and blues. Now, they may not have the use for all the greens and blues that you do, but they have a great use for the color white. They have 27 words for the color white. Therefore, they can use white much better than you can. They can mix with it better. They can manipulate with it better. So learn a good vocabulary and then learn how to mix visually. Let me show you some color charts that really do work. These charts work for two basic reasons. One, the chart is not printed inks. These are chips of paint. And the paint is matched to the color that's in the tube. So when you mix color, it matches and when you squeeze out color, it matches what's on this chart. This chart is also a map. It is a map of a three-dimensional color solid. Just like the world we live on is a three-dimensional solid, the world of color is also a three-dimensional color solid. This is a Munsell color tree, and it shows you the three dimensions of the world of color. For instance, this is all one color. That's called hue. This is all blue. Now, there could be hundreds of blues, but this is all one hue. So hue is any color, red, yellow, blue, chartreuse, leaf green, whatever. The second dimension of color is value. How light or how dark a color is is value. So this is a light value blue. This is a mid value blue. This is a dark value blue. Now, if you want to really see that in the terms of gray that it is described in, Take the knob on your set that says color and turn it off until you can see gray. Just stop your set, turn that knob on until you see nothing but gray, and you will see value levels. All right? That's value. Now, the hard part is intensity, describing intensity and separating intensity from value. Intensity is how bright a color is, how saturated it is, or how high the chroma is, as according to Munsell, that's his term. And Munsell is the international standard for notating color today. So chroma is how bright a color is or how far it is from its neutral gray. For instance, this is all a value five blue. It's all one hue, it's all one value. But this is a value five chroma, maybe one blue. This is a value five chroma, maybe five blue. And this is a value five chroma, 10 blue. So that's the three dimensions of color, hue, value, and chroma. Now, the color map is also a color solid. It comes in a flat version like this, but you can also turn it into a color solid by turning the ends one on to the other, okay? So this solid, much less expensive than this one over here, shows you the three-dimensional world of color. Let's get back to the color map and what it does. Since this is a flattened out map of a three-dimensional color solid. It works the same way as the map of the world or, say, the map of the United States. Let's put the map of the United States over this. It shows you how to get from one place to the other. For example, if we're here in New York and you want to go to Cincinnati, this is the shortest distance between two points. And if you mix this color, the color under here, with the color under here, you will mix the colors in between. That's the shortest distance in a color mix between those two colors. Now, this may seem awful simplistic to you, but bear with me because it gets to visual color mixing. If you want to go from New York to Miami, that's the shortest distance. This color and this color will mix all the colors in between. There is a problem, however, on a flattened map of a three-dimensional color solid. If you're going from Cincinnati to Los Angeles, that's a long route. And because of that, you will probably get a curve, a detour. Instead of arriving here, you will probably produce a color down in this area. If that happens, find out where you are. Take that paint that you've mixed and put it up here on this map, close to the map, so you can see what the color is. And if you're here and you want to be here, draw a line to where you want to be and extend the line. Anything beyond this point with good intensity added to this color will pull that color right back to where you want to be. This is the only color system that shows you how to correct a color mix that goes wrong. 
Now, I'm sure you've all had this happen. If you've mixed two colors together and didn't get the right color, and then you start adding a bit of this, and a bit of this, and a bit of this, and some of that, you wind up with piles of paint when you wanted a little piece, right? Well, this tells you, or shows you, how to get that immediate mix to correct the color. For instance, if you're here, and you want to be here, find out where you are, draw a line to where you want to be, and extend that line. Anything beyond that point, with good intensity, mixed with this color, will give you the color you're after. That's all there is to correcting a color mix. I'm sure you've noticed there are two different versions of this color map. One is oil and one is acrylic. The reason for that is the same pigment ground in oil doesn't look exactly the same when it's ground in acrylic. Now, let me show you what pigment in medium really is. This is pigment. It's a powdery substance that, when is added to a medium, produces a paint. This is an acrylic medium. It's labeled acrylic varnish and medium, but it's a medium which you can mix powdered color into and produce paint. Now, it's much more complicated when they do this in the plant, but this is basically what paint is, a combination of a medium which binds a pigment together. If you would mix this particular color, which is a naphthol crimson, with an oil medium, such as linseed oil, it would give you a slightly different hue and value. So if you're using oils, you need to use an oil chart. If you're using acrylics, you need to use an acrylic chart to make them more effective. Let me show you parts of the color map now so you can understand it a little bit better. We'll take this section right here in the yellow-green area and blow it up. Now, what you have a whole lot of chips here that are actual pieces of paint glued to the chart. When the chip has a name under it, that means you can buy that color. You can go down to the local store and buy the color. You can also mix that color. You don't necessarily have to buy it. But when the chip does not have a name, it has a painting knife, that means you have to mix that color. And then sometimes there are two or three names under a chip. That means there are two or three colors that are quite similar. A chip really is three chips in a row. The first part of the chip is the color squeezed directly from the tube in its most intense position. Or that is the most intense position that can be mixed at that color position on the map. The second two chips are the same color at a lower intensity. Now that is done by mixing the complement of a color, or a split complement as we talked about before, with the color and dulling it down, or better yet, mix a neutral gray of the same value with the color, and that will give you a lower intensity of this particular color. Neutral grays can be purchased, or you can mix them yourself. Then if it has two or three names, and this has four names under there, the first name is the color of the chip. The other colors are shown down at the bottom of the map. They may be a little higher in value, they may be a little lower in intensity, they may be a little lower in value. That's when we go to the bottom of the color map to see the differences. This is like a city map. When the congestion occurs, you go to the bottom of the map to see the differences between the colors. Let me show you a blow up of that now. The bottom section, for instance, has sections of color. In other words, all of these colors could be labeled cadmium red light. There's some company out there that produces a cadmium red light that looks like this. And I know at this point this is probably getting very pedantic for you, that it's becoming very tedious, but bear with it just a little bit longer and you'll be able to make intelligent choices about choosing colors, which ch colors to mix. And we'll get to the mixes in just a few minutes. This is the color straight out of the tube, or sometimes called the mass tone. And this whole column is mass tone material, scarlet red, cadmium red light, indo-orange red. The 5R, 5R, and 5RO indicate the column in which that color resides. It's sort of like latitude and longitude when you're dealing with a map. You also have two other columns here. One is a glaze column. That shows you what happens when a very transparent material, either an oil or acrylic medium, is added to the color. And this shows you what happens when white is added, a tint of the color uh, is done. 
You also have some other symbols in order to make intelligent choices here. The large G means it's a good glazing color. Goes transparent immediately with clarity when a medium is added to the color. A T means it is a good tinting color. The color goes a long way when white is added. And a scent mark means it's a relatively inexpensive color. So you can save money using those. The symbols here indicate a Roman numeral one all the way through, and that is a symbol that is used by the American Society for Testing of Materials to indicate permanency of materials. It's an independent organization that is testing all colors on the market for permanency. The category one colors that you see here are completely permanent. Category two, Roman numeral two colors, would be colors that could be used for inside easel painting, but you shouldn't use them for outside mural painting. And then category three colors are relatively fugitive colors. Uh, that includes some that are on your palette today, very popular colors such as alizarin crimson, rose matter, and true hooker's green, a pigment green eight. Then this gives you, this TL, the O and the TP, tells you the relative transparency of colors as well. TL is translucent, O is opaque, and TP is transparent. So now you have intelligent ways of choosing the proper color for your palette. If you want a transparent color in a glaze, this is what you need, an indo-orange red. If you want a color that goes a long way in a traditional color, cadmium red. If you want to save some money, you can use scarlet red as well. That will duplicate almost the effect of cadmium red, but will give you a good color at a cheaper price. Now these kind of symbols and this information is also reflected in the information on the tubes of paint. First you have the name of the color, a deep brilliant red. Under that, cadmium red deep hue. The cadmium red deep hue means that that is what a deep brilliant red relates to. The word hue means it's not the true cadmium red, but looks very similar and can be substituted for a cadmium red. Under that is a chemical name for the color and translations. Light fastness ratings are again given. The transparency, this is a translucent color, so that's given. Then the Munsell hue, value, and chroma positions, according to numerical notations, are also listed on the tube. And this symbol indicates where the color is on a 12-color circle. The 12 color circle is not scientifically notated as Munsell is. It's sort of done haphazardly and people put on colors that they seem to think so that should be right. So what we do is we give you an indication of the type of color and where it is on that particular circle. Now this shows what that hue band indicates on the tube. This is a red purple, a red, and a red orange. The center line means that this color, a scarlet red, would be a perfect red if there was an asterisk right on that line. However, the asterisk is toward the right, toward red orange. So this means a scarlet red is an orange type of red, and when colors are mixed with it, tends to shift to that orange position. The same thing with a cadmium red light. It's toward the red orange position. It is not a perfectly balanced red, and it will shift toward the red orange. An indo orange red is in a red orange column, however. The asterisk is toward the red, and therefore that color will shift toward the red. Now, on the back of the tube is some of the most important information, I think, that is available to the artist today. This symbol up here tells you whether or not that product is toxic or not. It is a CP non-toxic symbol. That means it's a certified product that is certified by the Art and Craft Material Institute, an independent organization, and it is certified to the standards of the American Society for Testing of Materials. This is a non-toxic material. You can actually eat it without any problem. I don't advise anyone to do that, but it's possible without any problems to get by with that. And that's important to me because I'm allergic to almost everything there is out there, including oil paints. I paint with acrylics almost entirely. Also on here, it tells you the vehicle is an acrylic polymer emulsion. It tells you the pigment and gives you a pigment index number that you can look up to make sure that that is proper. And it tells you a little bit about how to use acrylics. Now you've had almost as much information as you can possibly uh, sustain without becoming absolutely bored with all of this. And what we should do is move on to color mixing, the fun part of this, making color work visually. Let's get back to that first chart that we had, the blow up 
of the color map that shows you how colors work in a very systematic way. This color has a painting knife. Remember, when it has a painting knife, you have to mix the color. So that color has to be mixed. When it has a name, you can buy the color or you can mix the color. Now, this is the important thing to remember. Any two colors in a straight line make the color in between. So this color has a name. This color has a name. So this is a straight line mix, a horizontal mix. So if you mix this color, with this color, it'll give you the color in between. Now, you're not locked in to mixing that color one way. You may not have that on your palette. So you can move up here. This has a name, and this has a name. This is a diagonal mix. So this color plus this color will also give you that color in between. You can also mix vertically. This color has a name. The one here doesn't. That's when we have to move over and take a look at the color chart again. This is where we're working, right here. This is the color that we're trying to mix, right there. This color has a name, this one doesn't, but the one below it does. So those two colors will mix all the colors in between there. You can even mix this far in the color chart. That has a name, this has a name. So those two colors would mix the colors in between. But remember that the further you go on the color chart, the more detour that is obtained, the more curvature of the Earth's surface you're going to travel. So that line would go down below that particular point that you want to mix to about here, the second intensity version of a lower value color. If you're here and you want to be here, remember, draw a line to where you want to be, extend the line to an intense color, that color plus this color will give you the color in between. Now, let's do some of these mixes. I'll mix a yellow oxide and a light emerald green. It's nice being a technical consultant because you get all the free paint that you can use. Now, I'm not going to give you a percentage of color that you have to mix one into the other, say 50% of this or 50% of that. You just mix visually. As you saw, there are many types of cadmiums, and there are many types of earth color as well. In fact, if you thought cadmiums were bad, earth color is really bad. In fact, if you know what earth color is, it's exactly that. It's dirt. They dig it out of the ground, they put it in tubes, and they sell you dirt in tubes. But it's nice, clean dirt, okay? And it does the job, and it has parameters that they, they have so that it gives you the correct color. But it does change from tube to tube. If you've ever gone out and bought another tube of a color when you ran out, you would find that it's slightly different from the last tube. So you have to live with that. So you need to mix visually. Now, this mix that I'm doing here, is somewhat yellow. It's not quite as central yellow green as we need. So take a look at this, bring it over here, see where it is. Don't just think that you can remember where those colors are. Your visual memory is just not that good. Look at it, that's obviously too yellow. It's over this way. So add some more green until you achieve the in between color that you're looking for. That's not quite as homogenous as you need to see that color, but that is just about it. Now, I don't know how finely tuned your set is. It'll change a little bit from set to set, but you've mixed that color. Now, you can also mix this color another way, from Turner's yellow to permanent green light. That's the diagonal mix that we were talking about. This is permanent green light. And this is Turner's yellow. Now, I will be mixing a central yellow-green again, but it'll be slightly different in appearance than the one here. The difference will not be one of hue. It'll not be one of value. It'll be one of intensity or chroma, because this color is brighter than this color. We will have a mix that's a little bit brighter than the one down here. Mix it. See where you are, bring it over, and that is just about it. Okay? So you've mixed two colors now. This is an awfully bright green. This is like early morning sunlight behind a leaf green that is so brilliant that you hardly ever see anything that bright. And normally this is too bright for that particular type of green. Normally you have to dull colors down more than get in good intensity. So this color down here would be just as effective as this color would for a leaf green. Okay, now, 
Trying to save money in paint is also very important. Let's try to do that with color mixes as well. You can mix any color there is. You can mix a cadmium red, you can mix an ultramarine blue, you can mix any color, such as cobalt blue. Cobalt blue is probably one of the most expensive colors on the artist palette today. This is a cobalt blue, true cobalt blue. In fact, that's about two to three dollars worth of cobalt blue right there. Now, if you come over to the chart, I'll move this so you can see it, you'll find on the chart that there's a chip here that says cobalt blue, but also in that chip, it says brilliant blue purple. That means you can substitute that color, brilliant blue purple, for a cobalt. But when I squeeze it out like that, it's not quite the same color. And this is a very, very close color that we're going to show you, so your set may not be able to see it quite as well as it did with the greens. But this is a little bit darker than this color. All right? So what do you do to make a cobalt? You need to add white. So we can add white to both of these and see what the comparison is there. This is white to cobalt. And you'll notice when I start mixing the brilliant blue purple with white that the cobalt doesn't go quite as far as the brilliant blue purple does. It's a little bit stronger color, and yet it is a less expensive color. It's at least a third of the price of the cobalt. So let's mix white with that. And a little bit goes a long way. And again, there's still a little bit of color difference when you get that tint. The brilliant blue purple is a little bit more purplish. And the, the name should tell you that. It's a brilliant blue purple, right? If you look on the map, the cobalt, when you mix white with it, goes straight up the line. It stays in that hue position fairly well. But when I mix white with the brilliant blue purple, it tends to shift more toward the purple. So if you're here and you want to be here, find out where you are, draw a line to where you want to be, and extend the line. Anything in this area out here, you don't have to be that critical. Any sort of blue-greenish material out there will change that brilliant blue-purple. Pull it back toward the cobalt position. So let me do that for you. I'll get a uh, blue-green of some sort here and put that on. Now, add a very little bit. In fact, that is too much, much too much to change that whole column of blue to this particular blue-greenish material over here. So add a little bit of color, just a little bit. You can always add more, but if you keep adding large quantities of color, you wind up with bathtubs full of stuff that you'll never get rid of. So add a little bit of color, work it up the column. And again, as I said, this is a very tough mix to see the difference with your set, possibly. But now we have a cobalt position. It is over toward the greenish-blue position. It's not the purple material. And you've saved yourself at least a third of the price, if not more. Now, you can also do that with a cadmium red. You can mix red, you can mix blue, you can mix any color there is. To mix the column of reds, we use a warm red, start off with a warm red, and a cool red. This is a scarlet red here, this is an acro violet here. So, uh, much toward the cool red, but it's called violet. It's right on the cusp. It's right close to the edge of being violet or purple. When you add white to this, it does shift right over to the violet, to the acroviolet position. But you have a warm red and a cool red here on the map. So you can mix a warm red with a cool red, and you get all the reds in between there. So I can mix the two and produce cadmium red light, Cadmium red deep, cadmium red medium. In fact, I, I produced a cadmium red deep. I know I've produced a cadmium red deep because we've got so many of them here. I know I've produced one of them, right? So let's see which one we have. Well, right in about there is the cadmium red deep. I don't know if you can see that or not. We had just a little bit more of the orange to it to bring it up. And we have a cadmium red deep here that sells for, in oil, about $23 a tube. If you bought that in the scarlet red or Chinese red and an acroviolet position and mixed those, 
it would save you about two-thirds of the price in doing that. You can also match a traditional cadmium red medium the same way. This is a cadmium red medium. And you can also do this with the expensive colors as well. If you would like, you can throw a cadmium red light up there as opposed to the scarlet red and mix another in-between red as well. A little bit more opacity, but possibly not as much intensity when you mix. The initial mix will be intense, but when you start mixing with true cadmiums, they tend to be a little bit dirty in the mixing process. So we're working from an orange red, and you can duplicate that red fairly well. Can you see that? That's a duplication of cadmium red medium. Now, this leads us to the problem with using a primary color system. Red, yellow, and blue does not make all of the other colors. That system does not work precisely. So what we need to do at this point is to, now that we know how to shift color, all right, know how to make color work, we can take a look at the problem with primaries. We pick a red and a yellow and a blue. Now, you have choices at that. You can pick a cadmium yellow medium, or you can pick a brilliant yellow. Again, that saves you some money in the process. You can also use an ultramarine blue, or you can use a thalo blue. I produce, a th or rather prefer, a thalocyanine blue over the ultramarine. The problem then, though, is the red material that you add to the color. Most people will pick a central red, and that central red tends to be one like this, a cadmium red medium. When you mix these together, the cadmium and the brilliant yellow give you fairly decent oranges. And the yellow and the blue will give you fairly decent greens. But then we have the problem that we encounter with a central type of red. And that is when we mix red and we mix blue, we don't get anything that looks like purple or violet. Let me add a little bit of white to that so that you can see what color we have coming up there. Actually, we have a blue, add some more red, and you can produce a warm, neutral, and keep on going, and you have mud or neutral grays or neutral type muddy materials. In other words, you don't get violets or purples that way. So what do we do to make this work? Instead of using a central red or something that we would call red by American English terms, split that red. Do exactly what we did before. Use a orange red and a cool red. Again, this is scarlet red and acroviolet. We can mix then the central red, as we did before. The orange red now mixes with the yellow to produce better, more intense, more brilliant, more saturated oranges. And now the blue red will mix, or the cool red will mix with the blue to produce your purples and violets. So now we've solved the problem of we can go from very, very cool blue up the line to violet that way. We've solved the problem of mixing all colors. This is as few colors as you can put on your palette and still mix all the other colors possible. You still have a red, yellow, blue, but it is a split red that makes that happen. Now, let's go back to mixing the red again, and I'll show you how to make corrections that way. If you take that scarlet red and the acroviolet and mix them together to produce a cadmium red medium, you can get the mass tone, the color as it comes out of the tube, fairly well. But when you mix with that color, what happens? It's a slightly different color. 
it mixes somewhat differently. So when I start adding white to the true cadmium and white to the cadmium that I mixed, you'll see a difference in color shift. It's slightly different that way. So I'll add the cadmium to the white. And you can see how this sort of dulls down when I start mixing with cadmiums, as I said before. Then I can add the mixed cadmium red, and it goes much further and is more intense. But there is a slight difference in the colors here. Again, I'm not sure how your set's working, but this is a oranger red than this. This is a little bit bluer red. This shows a little bit cooler. This is a little bit warmer. Identify where that color is. Draw it on the map. Find out where you are. We mix the in-between red right here. And when we add white to it, it tended to shift because I used an acroviolet to mix it. It tended to shift or over toward the violet. The true red, or the cadmium red, tended to go up the column that way. If you're here and you want to be here, find out where you are and draw a line to where you want to be and extend the line. Anything in this area added to this color over here will shift it back to where you want to be. That's the basic rule. So we've got some orange material here. We've got a scarlet red, which is much more warm or orangish than what we uh, have on the palette. So add some to it. And at that point, we have shifted the color back to a cadmium red position. It is now a warmer red, and you have used a color that gives you more intensity, goes a little bit longer away, and still saves you at least a third of the price. So you can learn how to save money. You can make color systems work. Uh, you can make any kind of color mixer you can think of as long as you follow those basic rules of how to work with color from a visual point of view. It's quite easy. It should be fun. Okay? Come to the map. If you've mixed the color, find out where it is. If it's shifted too much, find out where you want to be, draw a line, shift it back. If the color has a name that you want to duplicate, you can buy the color or you can mix the color. If it doesn't have a name, it shows you how to mix that particular color. Now let's expand that palette that we started before of two reds and a yellow and blue to form a more efficient palette that will give you more mixes for less money with higher intensity than almost any other palette that you can structure. We started with a yellow, two reds, and a blue. The yellow was a brilliant yellow, or you could use a cadmium yellow medium. The blue was a, was a thalocyanine blue, or you could use an ultramarine blue. And we had two reds, a scarlet red and an acra violet. That gave you the in-between reds. Now we need to add a warm and a cool of each color. That gives us an expanded palette. We add a yellow here to mix yellows. If you add black to yellow to bring it down in value, you get green. It shifts. We add another blue, a brilliant blue, to achieve our blues. The greens weren't too effective, so we add a thalocyanine green and a permanent green light. That gives us our greens. Then we need a purple, a dioxazine purple, which mixes. Remember, this is a color wheel, a color solid, which mixes with the color on the other side, a medium magenta. Now that gives you 10 colors plus black and white. That gives you more color mixes with higher intensity at a lower price than any other color palette that I can think of. Now you can restructure this palette somewhat, and I'll show you what the result is when you mix those colors. This is that palette, 10 colors plus black and white over top of all the colors that are available, and it gives you good intensity of all those positions. But this is my palette. You should structure your palette to suit your own needs. And your palette should be your own. It should not be anyone else's. You're different next week than you are today. Next year, you'll be different. And so your palette should follow those personal differences. Your palette should grow with your growth. For instance, I have an area here of browns that are not too efficient. If you want and use a lot of brown, add another color to the palette. You could drop this intense red-purple if you have no use for that red-purple on your palette and throw in another color. 
So where you need intense color, that's where you put color on your palette. That's when you buy a color. When you don't need intense color, you can mix that color. Any color in its most intense position is a primary color in my vocabulary. That is my definition of primary color. You can't mix it. That's the traditional way of using color theory. You can't mix it. But any color in its most intense position cannot be mixed. Therefore, it has to be purchased where necessary. Now, you should be able to mix any color and structure your palette creatively. You should be able to mix visually, not verbally. In fact, I have recommended these color structures so often that they have produced them in various sets. You can also obtain a how to mix and use color booklet. It comes in three sections. Uh, the first section is on visual mixing and recaps a lot of what I've said. The second section is on the use of uh, an interaction of color, and the third section is on the technical end of pigments and how they are related to toxicity and permanency and so on. The booklet comes with the color map and mixing guide. At this point, I hope that you know how to mix any color creatively, immediately, and have some fun doing it. My name is Russell Woody. I hope to see you on future videotapes on materials and techniques.